Hello, and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. I'm Aviva Weintraub, director of the festival from the Jewish Museum. We co-present the festival with Film at Lincoln Center every year in January. And I'm really thrilled and delighted that we're presenting a special revival film this year called Kaddish by director Steve Brand. The film originally came out in 1984 and has been restored. And I'm delighted that to speak with me today, I have the filmmaker, Steve Brand, as well as the subject of the film, Yossi Klein Halevi, who is senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Welcome, Steve and Yossi. Thank you. Hi, nice to see you. So the film is so interesting on so many levels. And um, I was particularly struck at what a time capsule it is uh, of New York City, of the Jewish community in New York or communities um, in terms of the concerns that people had at that time. And it's so interesting to revisit them all these years later. Um, Steve, what inspired you to bring the film back out and do this restoration? Well, Yossi and I have been talking about bringing it back uh, for some time. Uh, the film was ba basically out of circulation. Uh, there wasn't even really uh, a DVD other than kind of a fairly amateur version that I had made from the VHS that my uh, distributor had been uh, marketing. And uh, the unfortunately, uh, my distributor had lost the original negative. And not only that, they also had lost the interpositive that was made from the original negative. So there were no master, you know, original master materials. And I was afraid, you know, that the film was going to be lost. And uh, so we applied for some grants and we got a grant from the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture that got us started. Thank you very much, Memorial Foundation. And uh, we were able to restore it from right in your neighborhood, right next door practically uh, at the uh, library of, for the performing arts at Lincoln Center, the New York Public Library had a pristine print of the film, which they were kind enough to loan us so that we could use that as the map. It had a couple of imperfections, but I had about 11 other prints lying around that had been heavily used, you know, kind of scratched and all that. But we were able to, the parts that didn't work so well in the Lincoln Center print, we were able to use other prints. So we scanned them all and, and I went to Indie Collect, which is a nonprofit that restores uh, films on the verge of being lost. And they did the restoration, they did a wonderful job. That's fantastic. Um... And, and what was it like to live again with all of the footage, with the film itself? Because I'm sure it was a very, very um, labor intensive and time consuming process. Well, I'll tell you, I'll just share an anecdote that when I went to Lincoln Center to screen the film, they also had some of the original press photos for the film. I had to put on these gloves to look at these archival materials that I had given them you know, these photographs and stuff to, to go through. But it was, um, you know, it was kind of a trip down memory lane uh, over and over again, because it took quite a while to do the restoration. There was, we had to resync it up. Fortunately, I had the original uh, 35 millimeter mix of the film, which is actually better sound than was in the original print because that's an optical track. This is magnetic sound, which is better quality. So it sounds better than it, than it did in the theaters, uh, hopefully it will, uh, back then. And uh, it was just amazing to uh, go through it. And one of the major things that we had to do is what we called, what I called schwitz removal, because there was dirt on the prints. Even though we cleaned it, there was dirt in all sorts of places, little hairs and stuff. And we had to individually remove all these little hairs and things in the film and crazy things. Uh, and that, you know, it took quite a while. And I also went back and some of the original interviews were done on three quarter inch tape when we first started. And that's wow. all the we had to 
to work with, including major interviews with Yossi and with his father. And we went back to, I still had the original three quarter inch tapes. And so rather than use the Kinney version of them, you know, that, that we did way back then, we went back to the original and digitized that and put that into the film. So it's better quality as well. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. It was and, quite a process. And Yossi, um, had you seen the film since the 80s? It's a really good question. Uh, I hadn't seen it for many years. Uh, I had a very ambivalent relationship with the film uh, for, uh, for at least two reasons. Uh, one uh, is because uh, I moved to Israel right around the time that Steve finished the film. And my life changed so drastically that I, I felt that uh, I felt I felt disconnected from the material in the film. Uh, the other reason that I felt uh, uh, strange about about the film was, uh, I think, for very understandable reasons, uh, it's it's an awkward experience to look at yourself when you're a teenager or in your early 20s. Uh, it's a period that, uh, that is probably best not to record <laughs> for, uh, for perpetuity, uh, <laughs> but there it is. And, and it took me many years to relax and, and uh, I, don't, I, I won't say enjoy the film, but to own it. And showing it to my kids really helped. Uh, I, I made a point of showing it to all three of my kids before their uh, bar or bat mitzvah. That I, I was part of the experience, and um, and the reactions were very mixed. You know, my daughter uh, looked, at, uh, sat there, watched uh, about twenty minutes, and said to me, uh, "Have I seen enough yet?" And I said, and my answer was, well, I, I suppose you have. <laughs> so, we, so we ended it there. Uh, she has seen it since. Uh, this, was, this was quite a while ago, uh, tw at least 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I feel incredibly grateful to Steve uh, to have given my children this gift of, of their grandfather, who they never knew. And uh, that's, that's really really precious and if they you know if they if they if they have to live with the awkwardness of seeing their father uh in uh, at their age then that's 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 a, a i think a small price to pay and my son saw it i was just oh sure my son saw it for the first my older son saw it for the first time when he was 13 in Berlin, it was at a, the Berlin, uh, oh, first wow. Berlin oh. Jewish Film Festival, and I took him with me, and he fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he fell asleep. <laughs> <in the theater>. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw it many years later uh, at, at MoMA, and you know he's seen it since, and and uh, he's he seems to uh, appreciate it. Uh, but I think he I think he managed to stay awake through the whole thing the second time. What was the response when you first released the film? I, I think it premiered at the New Directors New Films Festival in 1984. Yes, right, in April. Um, and there were two screens. And unfortunately, Yossi was in Israel. He couldn't be there. But his mother was there, which was wonderful. And uh, she became a kind of a celebrity. <laughs> In certain circles. She loved it, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was fantastic. I mean, I just have to say, Yossi's family was just fantastic in welcoming me and my crew into their house, into their lives, into their innermost thoughts over five years. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, not everybody will do that, you know. Um, and I just, there was a lot of warmth in that family that I, I um, hopefully captured some of in the film. And when you started out to make the film originally, um, you, you say it was a five year or so process. And I think there's, there's quite a lot of footage from the late seventies in the film. 
what did you have in mind? Is the finished product what you set out to make or did your um, idea of it change over time? Well, it changed over, it, originally it started out for me as a, as a two page proposal that I brought to a conference on Jewish films at the Martin Steinberg Center of the American Jewish Congress back in 76, I guess. And wow. it was a film about survivors who had come to New York. It's basically, it was, a, it was a question about Jewish resilience. How do Jews manage through the lens of the Holocaust experience to overcome these unbelievable calamities through the millennia, reestablish themselves, go on, and not only go on, but continue as Jews, you know, it's rather remarkable. Uh, and, you know, I come from a refugee family from Austria. And um, so I was interested in actually looking at Jews who've settled in New York City and how they made the transition, et cetera. And Yossi was at the conference and he had a proposal of his own. I think it was also two pages. And we seemed to be the only ones at the conference who were interested in each other's proposals. Uh, there was someone there from one of the major organizations, Jewish organizations who had no interest whatsoever in documentaries. They were only interested in doing trigger films for specific causes that they were raising money for. So Yossi and I decided to work together. Uh, his film, his project, I mean, Yossi, maybe you can, if you remember, I don't know. what. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't remember what the proposal was, but I do remember that initially uh, we conceived of a film that would trace the Holocaust through three families. Uh, we would begin with, right? We would begin with your family and that would tell the story of the German uh, Austrian Jewish experience. Uh, we would then move to a, a Polish family. And, and uh, I was there with a friend of mine, uh, Bob Rosenberg, who, uh, who, whose background is, uh, his, his father was a survivor from Poland. Uh, and then we would end the film with my family, Hungarian Jews. And so the film would progress. It would tell the story of the Shoah as, as it chronologically unfolded through these through three families. And fortunately, the other two families were, were camera shy and they said, start with someone else. And my <laughs> father had been waiting for... Uh, really since the war for someone to show up with a camera and, uh, and interview him. So when Steve showed up, you know, my family was just thrilled. So when Steve talks about being warmly accepted, you know, from, from <laughs> my father's point of view, this was, you know, where, where, where have you been all my life? And, um, and fortunately, I say we started with my father because about a year into the filming, he, he got a heart attack and died. And so suddenly... I'm speaking now not as a as a uh, as 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 my father's son, but as uh, uh, from an artistic point of view, uh, we had a really interesting film, and uh, and we realized that this needs to be the subject of the film: the death of a survivor and how a family contends with with the aftermath. And uh, and it's it's interesting because when we started this project. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but I don't think there were any films yet on children of survivors. Uh, and um, we were, from our point of view, I think we were, we were the first. I'm not sure that we were the first by the time the film came out. It took us longer than we thought it would take. We, it took us time to raise the money. Uh, but certainly this was really one of the very first uh, in the genre. Well, it was. This was all sort of in the time when Roots came out on television and became the sensation. And Helen Epstein's book on children of survivors, uh, children of the Holocaust, I think it was called, came out. Uh, so all of a sudden there was this, and we were like already talking about this at the same time. And actually, Jesse, what you were talking about was actually the the second stage of what we were doing, because initially we were going to do this film about the Holocaust 
And we spent months meeting and arguing, the three of us, it was originally the three of us were gonna make this film, you and Bob Rosenberg and myself. And uh, we were just arguing about what's the film gonna be? What's it gonna be bad? Right. What are we what's right. the focus? And then we discovered that the BBC had done this four part mini series on the final solution. And it's like, they kind of stole our thunder. You know, it's like, that's, oh, well, that's, I guess we, we're not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And we had the opportunity to apply for a, a youth grant at NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities. And we said, well, what can we, what can we tell them we can do that for $10,000, which is how much was available. And we decided, well, let's, let's tell them we're gonna do a film about our three families. And we got the grant. It was the first grant we applied for. And he said, hey, you know, this actually is not a bad idea. Maybe we should actually do it. Because we had, a, you know, we had a Hungarian family hiding, we had a camp survivor family. We had the uh, assimilated Jews from Austria uh, who were refugees who escaped out to Kristallnacht. So it seemed pretty compelling. I had not even mentioned it to my parents <laughs> that we were, had written a proposal that they were in. And... Uh, and then uh, Bob's family decided they didn't want to participate. And, uh, and then it was actually six months after we started filming with, with Yussi and his father and still looking for other families to replace you know, uh, Bob's family. Uh, six months later, Yussi's father passed away. And it you know, dawned on, on me that this is, this is the film. This is going to be the film. Uh, we don't need other other families. Let's do like uh, the microcosm and see how you know that can resonate to other families, other experiences. And I think not only uh, to Jews and Jewish Holocaust survivors. I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of cultures, a lot of families that can identify with this experience. Unfortunately from different parts of the world and different experiences. Yeah, I think it's, it's worth um, really restating that this was a rare uh, documentary film at the time. Uh, since 1984, there have been hundreds, if not more um, documentary films about the Shoah, um, about the effects on subsequent um, family members and generations and it's, um, it must have been, I mean, literally groundbreaking, um, but what, what was the public response to the film? Or if you remember the critical response, I mean, were people saying this is a new genre that is, you know, worthy of exploration? Well, there actually were, there were actually three films coming out at the same time, including ours, really within months of each other on children of survivors. Wow. The others were kind of looking at many different families. Uh, this was the only one that focused on one family and from a, you know, a very personal experience all the way through. Um, and they were actually all reviewed together in Hadassah magazine. I remember at one time, but the response to this film was um, very gratifying. I mean, the reviews were astonishingly positive, uh, except for the New York Times, which basically described the film, but they didn't really offer much in the way of commentary. But, you know, other, you know, David Denby, David Edelstein, um, many reviewers around the country had really, you know, plotted. So David Edelstein called, uh, described Yossi as a Moses who's seen too much. <laughs> Uh, you know, and uh, it was made the uh, Edelstein's uh, 10 best list in the Village Voice for the 1985 films. Um, and it, it uh, won a documentary award in Su Sundance. It, it, it got wonderful reviews around the country and it played theatrically uh, and at festivals around the world. It didn't make any money, but it, but it got wonderful reviews. Uh, you know, and it aired on, on public television back in New York only in, in 1987 and on Bravo. And, um, 
And it was at many major film festivals. It was at the first Moscow Jewish Film Festival and the first Berlin Jewish Film Festival. I'll just to tell you a story about Moscow, because as you know, Yossi was a Soviet Jewry activist showing the film in Moscow hmm. in, I think it was 91, 92, something like that, was an extraordinary experience because there are all these Soviet Jews in the audience and they're watching the story of these activists coming into the Soviet immigration office and trying to take it over and being beaten up by the KGB and having a sit-in outside the immigration office in Moscow. People just applauded. They were ecstatic. It was amazing. It was an amazing, chilling. I wish you could have been there, Yossi. It was just yeah, an extraordinary yeah, wow. experience to show it there. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it is, um, that is one of the very interesting parts of the film, looking at the history of the Free Soviet Jury movement, which was huge here at the time. Um, Yossi, what, what do you remember about your involvement from those times? Well, uh, what I remember is actually what was left out of the film, uh, <laughs> which is that I gravitated uh, to the Jewish Defense League, to the JDL, um, because I felt that the mainstream Soviet Jewry movement was too timid. Uh, this was around 1971. Uh, I was 17 uh, when I started going to JDL demonstrations. And the, the sit-in in Moscow was actually a JDL event. And when the film came out, I was, I was surprised that JDL wasn't mentioned. And I just assumed that Steve wanted to downplay the the uh, uh, let's say the more uh, the more seamy side of of my my activist story. And then just recently, Steve said to me, "You know, I had no idea you were in the JDL. Why didn't you tell me?" And so I, I you know, this was really crossed signals. Uh, I wish that it. I wish that I had told him because uh, it was a very important part of, uh, of where this story um, unfolded. You know, you, I, in, a way, in a way, what this film is about is, is this, this, this young person's struggle uh, to, to unpack this, this, this load that, 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 that his father put on him. And so, the JDL and Jewish extremism was really an important part of, of trying to deal with that. And, and I remember when, when, um, when the film came out, I, I felt that that, that that part of my story, which for me was really so seminal uh, and, and for, for, for reasons that I did not understand then, uh, had had been uh, excluded from the film. I felt the need to tell that story, and so I ended up writing my first book, uh, which really revisits the material uh, in in Kaddish, but from a very different perspective. And it's called Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist, and it really focuses on the 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 development of a of a young extremist uh, sensibility. And I'll just tell you, you know, and I, when I read the book, which was a wonderful book, uh, that's when I learned that Jussie, Jussie had been in JDL. And I said, why, did, why didn't he tell me? He never told me I would have put it in the, you know, the film. And I didn't, you know, back then you couldn't Google somebody and find out, oh, JDL, look at all the photos, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, so, and he never mentioned it to me. And he did tell me about throwing bags of blood at the Ukrainian ballet, but he didn't say it was a JDL. In, um, let's, let's, let's be more specific, Steve. Okay. It was at, uh, it was at Lincoln Center. Since we're... <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it was at the Metropolitan uh, uh, Opera, Opera House. And um, Ukrainian, the Ukrainian dance company in uh, summer 1972. Yeah, so. it seemed a little extreme for student struggle for Soviet Jewry, but I didn't make the connection back then. I guess I just hadn't done my research. And uh, so I didn't find out till later. And I just felt he didn't want me to know because he didn't want he didn't want that in the film. <laughs> so there you go. Took us, what, almost 40 years to uh, realize that uh, we had miscommunicated on that. 
Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, I, I felt like in the film there was uh, an interesting line being drawn between the Soviet jury movement and um, people sort of awakening pro-Israel feelings. Um, and there was in particular conversation, Yossi, with your parents. Um, I, I wonder if you could just, be, because I think um, the concerns, let's say of the American Jewish communities at the time were, were different from now um, because the, the world, the country is different and the world is so different. Um, can you situate a little bit what that pro-Israel feeling um, meant at the time, if that question makes sense? Yeah, very much so. Um, the Soviet Jewry movement uh, coincided, uh, or let's say the, the awakening of, uh, of Jewish consciousness in the Soviet Union uh, coincided with the Six Day War. Uh, it was really the, the, the war that, that inspired young Soviet Jews to begin that very heroic process of reclaiming their Jewish identity and of uh, actively opposing uh, the Soviet government. And, and that had in turn a, um, a very powerful impact on, uh, on the generation of, of, Amer of American Jews that were coming of age in the 1960s. And so what you really see in that film is a convergence of, of the Soviet Jewry moment, uh, the post-1967 uh, enthusiasm for Israel, uh, and the American 60s, which, um, which is really hovering in the background of the film and, uh, and, and had, a, had a, a formative impact on, uh, uh, certainly on, on Jewish activism. You know, we saw ourselves as being the, the Jewish analog to what was happening uh, in the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. Uh, there was very much of, of, of it. So, so we were getting, uh, we were drawing inspiration simultaneously from Israel, from the Soviet Union uh, and from the American 60s. And it all converged at that moment. You know, just to add to that, um... What we're putting out at the DVD and Blu-ray and digital downloads with the film, and there'll be bonus features, including a 30 year later interview with Yossi and an interview with me and uh, deleted scenes. And one of the deleted scenes is called America in the 60s. And mm. it's basically about Yossi's and his father's slightly different <laughs> viewpoints <laughs> on America in the 60s and what it meant. And how, you know, for Yossi's general, it was exciting. It was, you know, and, and for, for his dad, it was, uh, these kids don't know what they're doing. <laughs> oh, worse than that, Steve, it was, the decline, it was the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's all, that's all there. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, there's a quintessential moment when Zoltan recalls uh, being in the, Klein's confectionery truck with Yossi making deliveries in Manhattan. And there was a demonstration for Biafra. And Yossi wanted to get out of the van and join the demonstration. And his father said, you remembered? Yes. He said, I don't remember the exact words, but I the, certainly the sensibility was nobody cares about us and you should only demonstrate for Jews. You shouldn't have anything to do with anyone else, you know. He didn't say that. He said, look, these are poor people and they have a valid cause, but we have our own family. We have, you know, if you, there are Jews all over the place. If you want to go and demonstrate, demonstrate for a Jewish cause. So it was a little softer than you <laughs> just put uh -huh. out, uh, at least in his version of it. <laughs> <laughs> You, yeah, you, yeah. you talked about the, the 60s, uh, the scene a little bit just now. There's a fascinating um, scene in the film where um, I, I guess there was a fascination with the punk scene um, and a kind of confluence of Hasidic 
post-apocalyptic. Can, can you um, talk a little bit about that nugget? Yeah, uh, I was living in the East Village um, at the time. Um, this was this was just before I moved to Israel, uh, 1982, and. Um, there, it was um, the punk scene was was still fairly vibrant uh, at that time, and I was fascinated by this uh, apocalyptic outbreak, and 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 I felt that this sort of private Jewish apocalyptic uh, fantasy that I that I nurtured growing up had suddenly become part of of the consciousness of the whole generation and and this was really interesting to me and uh and so i i i wrote an article of uh, about going back and forth between uh the the hasidic communities in borough park uh, which were survivor communities in those years uh and the uh and these apocalyptic gatherings uh, the concerts the bars in the east village and um and it was really about uh living living with the consciousness of uh, of endings endings beginnings and um and you know it's 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 interesting that i think for you steve the the film really is about uh apocalyptic consciousness which of course is 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 so widespread today, and it's it's an interesting coincidence that we've released this film uh, at a time when the world feels so apocalyptic. And and I I don't sound quite as much of a of a raving lunatic in the film uh, as I did when it was made, uh, and that that really uh, that really troubles me because uh, I I I I don't want I don't own that sensibility anymore. I'm I'm very I'm very happy in my life. I really don't want the apocalypse to come in any form. And uh, the notion that these these apocalyptic fantasies that uh, that that were so much a part of of who I was growing up uh, is now. Um, it's now in some in some sense mainstream uh, really worries me. Well, there's a lot to be apocalyptic about. I mean, one of the lines in the film, I remember you were saying, talking about the 1980s. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be fascism from the right, fascism from the left. You can pick your paranoid fantasies, but I think we're on the verge of something unhealthy. And that was back in 81 or so you said that. And now it's like you can pick your apocalypse. Is it going to is it going to be the the environment? Is it going to be a plague? Is it going to be, you know, uh, you know, refugee up upsurges, displacements, sometimes based on climate change? Uh, there are all sorts of apocalypses apocalypses to choose from. And what's interesting, one of the things that's interesting to me in knowing you over the years is that. When we made the film, your focus to me seemed to be very much based on what had happened in the past. You know, the the residue of, of history and, and its impact on today and the fear that it's all going to happen again. And now you seem maybe having three children has something to do with it, much more focused on the future, not obsessed with the apocalypse is coming. And I think it's also very much part of having moved to Israel. So I think now you are, you're much more future oriented. Back then, the past seemed to control much of your, your thinking through your father's imprecations. Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's right. That's right. And um, I think living in Israel really um, gives you an appreciation of uh, the need uh, not to live in a mindset of threat because we we live with threat as part of our daily reality and the way that Israelis cope and and I think part of my my becoming an Israeli in in a, in a fuller sense 
was learning the Israeli uh, skill set of uh, the pretense of normal life that you know you could have a suicide bombing uh, at a bus stop and a few hours later uh, the cleaning crew has already um, wiped away any any indication of 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 disaster and people are just standing there waiting for the next bus and and that's really how Israelis cope and so when I when I listen to the the hysterical teenage apocalyptic voice in in the film uh, it's so antithetical to to the Israeli mindset that uh that it's it's you know aside from the 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 process of growing up and 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 having more at stake in a in a normal and stable life uh it's also really changing cultures and uh and that's i think had a had a very a very big impact on also on on how i relate to the film and uh, and and why it was so difficult for me all these years to fully uh to fully own it I think a lot of the film was also, uh, you know, you know, your grieving process uh, with your dad. I mean, in, in a very public right. way. Right. And I think some of the, uh, you know, apocaly apocalyptic feelings that you you had as you resumed your life and went back into journalism after after running the candy business for over a year. Uh, was this loss and, you know, really uh, of this major part of your life. Uh, and just coping with that and dealing with that and put, trying to put, put everything together again. As I you think said, I, yeah, I think you're right. You know, the hardest moments for me in the film uh, is watching me trying to be honest about my grief, but doing it publicly and not being able to really be honest. And it was so dissonant and, and frankly, such a, 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 a bizarre experience. Uh, that uh, and that took me, I think, many years to 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 get over, and to really be able to mourn in a in a private way. Thank you. Um, I, I think what you're what you've been articulating these past few minutes uh, really speaks to why the, one of the reasons the film is so compelling to watch um, today. So I'm I'm really pleased that people will have a chance to see it again. Um, can you each tell us a little bit about what you're working on now or what your future projects might be? Steve? Sure. Uh, well, I've been working for some time now on a, another documentary. Uh, this is a biography, uh, the, the life, thought, and impact of uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I'm sure many of the people watching this will know about, but those who don't, he was a, uh, a theologian. Uh, he taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary for many, many years, died in 1972. And he was also a major uh, social justice, human rights activist. He was involved in the civil rights movement, the Soviet Jewry movement, uh, the Second Vatican Council, uh, he wrote a book about Israel after the Six Day War, um, a very uh, outspoken kind of prophetic individual is one of his books on the prophets who was very influential in the civil rights movement. And it, to me, in, a, in certain ways, this is a sort of a sequel <laughs> for me, at least emotionally, philosophically uh, from Kaddish in that Kaddish poses the question by the end of the film, you come from this view of life as one of victimhood to one of survival. And now the question is posed, survive for what? And we, we address that somewhat in Kaddish. Yes, he talks about that. But this is, and Heschel's life was all about survive for what? As a Jew, survive for what? What does it mean to be to be? Jewish in the in the fullest sense, and uh, so for me, it's it's it also addresses the question of you know where was God during the Holocaust that we touch on in Kaddish, but it, it gets explored in, uh, much further in this film. 
So that's what well, I'm Viva, it's an interesting question for me because uh, I'm actually going back to this material for the first time um, in probably 40 years. And uh, I'm writing a book about um, the wisdom of Jewish survival. And uh -huh. it asks the question, the starting question of the book is, how did we move from the lowest point in Jewish history, which was 1945, to what I would argue is the peak moment in Jewish history, which is today. We've never been more powerful. We've never had the world's attention to the extent we have now. We've never been more center stage. Uh, our story has never been of greater interest to, to the world in good ways and less good ways, but there's 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 clearly a, a, a focus, even an obsession on our story. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand how American Jewry and Israel together saved the Jewish people. And I'm, I'm it's not so much a, 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 um, a history lesson as it is looking at the transition from the 20th to the 21st century. And what is it that the Jewish people in the 21st century need to carry from the 20th century? Uh, what do we need now uh, that, um, that will help us navigate the much more complicated, morally complicated world that the Jewish people lives in today? And you, you alluded to that in your question about Israel. You know, for for our generation, we, we were 20, 30 years after the Shoah. Uh, Israel was fighting existential conflicts. Soviet Jewry was fighting to to be free. All of those were 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 really black and white uh, struggles. It was good good versus evil, and it's no longer so clear in Jewish life. So, what is it that's useful from that period for us, and what's not useful? So I'm trying to, in a way, sum up, and it's a very personal book, I'm, and I'm going back to my father, and I haven't written about my father really in, in 40 years. And so I'm trying to do this now, I'm almost 70, and I, it's, a, it's a kind of a retrospective, uh, both personally and, and, uh, a ge and it's a generational story as well. Well, both those projects sound amazing, and um, I look forward to, to learning more about them as they evolve. I, I want to wrap up now and thank you both so very much for the film and for taking the time to speak with me today. Well, Aviva, thank you for the opportunity, first of all, to speak about Kaddish with, with Steve. Uh, this is something that's, that's taken us way too long to do, and I'm just really thrilled that we're able to do it, and thank you. Thank you very much, Aviva, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to, to chat about this a, a little more. I think the last time we, we were together talking about Kaddish perhaps was when it screened in Israel in like 1985 or something like that, so it's, it's been quite some time, uh, wow. long road traveled. Thank nice. you so much, Aviva. Thank you.